And this event happened during the Feast of the Tabernacles of the Booths. But I won't go into that. So what did Simon mean when he said, it is great to be here, it is beautiful to be here? W, the elevation, being in solitude, away from the hustle and bustle of the crowd? No. What Simon was saying is that it is great to be here because we feel. You probably didn't understand. We feel that we are in the presence of the Lord. We now feel that we are in the glory of God, the power of God. We feel that we are in the presence of the sovereignty of God. And as I said, you and I today, right at this moment, there is no greater place to be than in this house of the Lord. Because we are in the presence of the Lord. We are in the service of the Lord. We are in the grace, the mercy of God. We are going to partake, have a, a spiritual, mysterious relationship with our heavenly bridegroom. And the greatest place to be is the house of the Lord. Our um, scripture... I have a scripture on the, on the screen, Psalm 84, verse 10. Because one day in your court is better than a thousand. That moment that Simon was on that, on that mountain, that, we don't know how long this took, let's say an hour. Let's say this took an hour, or a half an hour. I think that was the, the greatest and the most moving half hour of Simon's life. That's why he said, it is great for me to be here. This half an hour that I spent with you, Lord, in your presence cannot be compared or the days of my life in the world cannot be weighed and compared to this precious moment that I have with you and that is being in your presence. And the psalmist goes on to say, better than a thousand that is out in the world. I have desired to dwell in the house of God more than to dwell in the tent of the wicked. You know what was going down you know, back into the people down on the, on the bottom of the mountain, the people living their lives. Probably, the, 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 you know, Christ's uh, uh, opposers were waiting for him to come down. They were still, um, uh, you know, trying to catch him, trying to somehow put him to death. And the, and the disciples would witness this. The disciples would see and witness the opposition that this Christ was receiving, but couldn't do anything at that moment. And he took them up into the mountain, and that was an amazing place to be. Now, before this, Jesus talks about this Christ, this Son of Man, he's going to die, he's going to be beaten, battered, he's going to be spattered. And as I said in Luke, he predicts his death, but so that his disciples and you and I would not be left with that image of only the passion of Jesus Christ. Just imagine there was no transfiguration. Just imagine Jesus didn't fulfill any, any uh, didn't come, uh, work any miracles. You just imagine that Christ came and preached and died and that's it. It would be very difficult for the church to preach that this Jesus is God, is glorious. But God, Christ has not left no eyes undotted and no T's uncrossed for you and I. We have been overwhelmed with testimonies that this Jesus wasn't just a mere prophet, a mere poor man who was again always opposed and always always showed that that he is he is is nothing what uh, according to what he's saying to me. He shows them, he takes them up to, into the mountain and shows them the glory of the Father. He didn't just take him up there and say, I'm going to show you something. Look, this is where I was before the world was created. No. He showed them the glory of the Father, which is His. He showed the disciples, He showed us that this is truly the same God with the same glory and splendor as St. Paul writes in the um, next verse. And He, Jesus Christ, is the radiance of His, that is the Father's glory, and the exact representation of His nature. So right at that moment, the disciples were being probably thinking, whoa, this is what we follow, great. That's why Simon is so moved to say, I'm going to stay here, Lord. 
I want to stay here. I don't know what's coming on. I just feel this. There's something more about you. Yes, we were amazed. We were mesmerized by, by your words and your, and your deeds and your miracles and your love and your compassion and your healing. But right now, it's amazing, Lord. I cannot describe what it's amazing. We say to, in one of the Vespers prayers, we conclude and we say, Glory to you, Jesus, our conquering King, the brightness of the eternal Father. So Jesus says he's going to be killed, murdered. Then he shows his glory. But look at what happens immediately after that. Simon says, uh, Simon says, we want to stay here. But everything is then concluded. Jesus touches them and says, no. The Trinity was evident there. The Father was speaking. The Son was being transfigured. And the cloud representing the Holy Spirit. But Jesus touched and says, no, Simon, we need to go back down here. We need to serve. I need to die. I showed you this so that you are not discouraged and you don't give up. That you always remember that I am the King of Kings who was born. I am the Messiah and the sacrificial lamb who was killed. I am the conqueror of death through my resurrection. I have, will return back to the glory that I emptied myself from, St. Paul says, and came down and took this image for you and for the entire world. I will return back to my glory and I will one day return to take you all into that same glory. The transfiguration, beloved, we each have a personal feast that we celebrate. Our Pentecost is when we are baptized and receive the Holy Spirit. Our transfiguration is when we change our mind. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, of this world, St. Jesus, but be renewed with the changing of your mind. Transfigure your mind, your life, so that you may also have a part in the glory. And we do. One of the church fathers writes that God created man to be divine, to have a part in, in, in his divinity, through grace. Jesus had the same divinity through his nature. You and I, which we take for so granted. We don't spend time to, to meditate and to ponder on this. That we are not only the children of God, we not only have a, a part and participation in the birth, death, and we will have participation in the resurrection of our God, but we have a part, we are joined with God through divinity. We have the Holy Spirit. Which Jesus says, do not be afraid. You have that great power. Nothing can conquer you. And on that mountain, Christ revealed himself so that he will give us an everlasting encouragement and hope that we do not worship a mere person. We do not worship a mere human being or a prophet. We do not only worship a good person. We worship the Son of God, the Christ, the true Son of God, the incarnate of God, the God that incarnate, who is resurrected, and one day will return. And I emphasize, beloved, for those who are in kind of faith, no, just believe, just believe, there is nothing further from the truth and blasphemy, because it's against the Holy Scriptures. Jesus himself, not St. Paul, St. Paul mentions it, actually, the Gospels, the, the Scriptures are so echoing this in Psalms, in Proverbs, in the Gospel, and in the Pauline the letters. Jesus himself says that the Son of, this is my, oh, sorry, that every man, when the Lord, when the Son of Man returns in the glory of his Father with the holy angels, and he will repay each man according to his works. Judgment is according to works, without works. Just to claim you believe in God is not enough. Just to have works without faith, it's only routine. Faith and deeds. We believe in this Lord Jesus Christ and we must obey. He who hears my words and fulfills them, Jesus likens to the wise man who builds his house, his salvation, 
upon the Lord. Glory, praise, and honor be to Christ our Lord now and all times and forever. Amen.